Today we're going to be taking a look at the Orange Pi 5 Pro. This is a new SBC from Orange Pi that is based on the rock chip RK3588S SOC. The RK3588S is largely similar to the RK3588, with the main difference being a reduction in PCIe lanes from 4 to just 1. Given the form factor, I.O. and port layout, the Orange Pi 5 is clearly targeted as an alternative to the Raspberry Pi 5. So let's see how its price, performance and usability stack up. Taking a look around the board, the RK3588S processor is in the middle. This is an 8-core 64-bit processor that consists of a 4-core Cortex-A76 processor running at 2.4GHz and a 4-core Cortex-A55 processor running at 1.8GHz. In addition to this, it's got an ARM Mali G610 GPU. So we should get really good performance from it with double the CPU cores of the Raspberry Pi 5. Although 4 cores are running at a slightly lower clock speed. Alongside the processor is the RAM chip. The Orange Pi 5 Pro comes in a 4GB, 8GB and 16GB variant, all with LPDDR5 RAM. This is a step up from the LPDDR4 RAM on the non-Pro version of the Orange Pi 5. Above that is the Wi-Fi 5 and Bluetooth 5 chip and the DSR port alongside it. Similar to the Raspberry Pi 5, the Orange Pi 5 Pro has a gigabit Ethernet port on one side, alongside four USB ports. But notably, three of these are USB 2.0, and only one is USB 3.0. They've also included a header for additional USB 2.0 ports behind the physical ports. This could be useful for builds into enclosures. Along the other side is an HDMI 2.0 port, an audio port, an HDMI 2.1 port and a USB-C power port. The HDMI 2.1 port can do 8K60 and the HDMI 2.0 port can do 4K60. I like that they've made space for full-size HDMI ports. I don't really like how fragile the micro HDMI ports on the Raspberry Pi 4 and 5 are, and you often require adapters or special cables to plug into them rather than the more commonly available full-size HDMI cables. It's interesting that they've chosen to keep the audio port since the Raspberry Pi 5 did away with it. On the opposite side is a 40 pin GPIO header. This follows the same pin layout as the Raspberry Pi boards. It's also color coded which makes it a bit easier to locate the 5V, 3.3V and ground pins. Next to these pins are a 5V fan connector and a real time clock connector. Underneath the board is a prominent M.2 M key port. This allows you to connect an NVMe SSD to it, although it is only a PCI Express Gen 2x1 port, so it won't be that fast by today's standards. It's also got a connector for additional eMMC storage, a micro SD card slot, and two camera ports. So that's an overview of the hardware. As you can see, the I.O. is somewhat limited due to the single PCI Express lane on the RK3588S but you've still got a range of options and support for an NVMe drive without an adapter. Hopefully the power of the CPU and the improved RAM will make up for some of the I.O. limitations. So let's get it booted up and find out. To power the Orange Pi 5 Pro, you can get a 5V 5A USB-C power supply from Orange Pi. This has the same specs as the Raspberry Pi 5's official power supply, so you can use one of those too. Like with other Orange Pi boards, the main operating system that they want you to run on it is called Orange Pi OS. They've got a couple of options for this, including an Arch Linux and Android version, and they include some other images like Ubuntu and Debian images. I'll be using the Debian image for testing, as this is what I've tested other SBCs on, so the results will be better to compare. I've got the OS flashed onto a micro SD card, which the Orange Pi is booting off, and I've added an NVMe drive for storage to do a benchmark on as well. I'm going to test this in the same way that I usually test SPCs. We'll first test some video playback at 1080p and 4K, then try run a Sysbench benchmark. I'll then take a look at the NVMe disk speed, and finally look at power consumption. The first boot on the new operating system takes a bit longer than subsequent boots, but we're still on the desktop in under a minute. If we open up HTOP, we can see we have our 8 processor cores listed. They're all relatively idle at the moment, and we can see our 16 gigs of RAM. We can see our NVMe drive is connected, which is also apparent through the desktop icon. First let's try playing back a YouTube video in the default browser Chromium. I'm going to do this at 1080p and then try 4K. We'll set the display resolution to 1080p, 
Then let's open up the browser. Then go to YouTube and open up Big Buck Bunny. I'll set the playback resolution to 1080p as well. And open up Stats for Nerds. Video playback in the window drops a few frames in the beginning, but after that is near perfect. Playback is also okay in full screen, but it does drop a couple of frames every so often which is noticeable, and this becomes annoying. Next let's step it up to 4K. I did encounter some weird behaviour when changing to 4K. The display wouldn't refresh when the setting was applied, and you could clearly see that the resolution hadn't changed, although it showed up as if it had. A reboot after changing the settings seemed to fix the issue and it then booted up in 4K. Next we can reopen the browser and Big Buck Bunny. We'll set the playback resolution to 4K as well. In 4K, playback gets off to a pretty poor start. We dropped a large number of frames in the beginning and continue to drop frames throughout playback. Opening up to full screen is even worse, and is basically unusable. So this board does quite a bit worse than the Orange Power 5 Plus at 4K playback. But this is probably a software issue with the board using software decoding instead of hardware decoding. Opening up HTOP, the CPU is at about 40-50% utilisation across all cores. This is a lot more than the 20-30% utilisation on only the first 4 cores that we had on the 5 Plus. To jump in here, if you're going to be primarily using the Orange Power 5 Pro as a media device, then you'll likely want to go with the Android image. This tends to perform better for video playback. Next let's check the performance of the 5 Pro by running a Sysbench CPU benchmark. After 10 seconds we've processed a little under 5350 events per second, and we get a total score of 53,519. Over three tests, the Orange Power 5 Pro managed an average of 53,520. For comparison, and also over three consecutive tests, the Rock Power 5B managed an average of 53,642. The Cardass Edge 2 managed an average of 51,568. And the Orange Power 5 Plus managed an average of 53,436. The Raspberry Power 5 manages an average of 35,000. So the results of the Orange Power 5 Pro are a bit better than the Cardass Edge 2 with the same SoC. They're actually very similar to the Rock 5B and Orange Power 5 Plus, which have the better RK3588 CPU. They're also significantly higher than the Raspberry Pi 5, with an over 50% improvement. Thermally, you probably want to use a heatsink on the CPU if you're running CPU intensive tasks. After playing back 4K video for around 15 minutes, the Orange Power 5 Pro CPU was at 70 degrees, and the surface of the CPU was at 55 degrees. This was also in a relatively cool room with an ambient temperature of just 20 degrees. Next let's look at the NVMe disk speed. For this test I'm going to be using James Chambers' Pi Benchmark script. I've used this script recently to benchmark a few different NVMe hats for the Raspberry Pi 5. I ran the test three times with very consistent results across the three tests. I got an average total score of a little over 16,000. The Raspberry Pi 5 had results slightly under 60,000, so the Orange Pi 5 Pro is significantly slower than the Raspberry Pi 5. This is likely due to the one generation reduction on the PCIe port. Lastly, let's take a look at power consumption. To measure the 5 Pro's power consumption, I used a USB power meter cable that supports power delivery. This showed that the 5 Pro uses about 3 watts when idle, and it goes up to about 6 to 8 watts when loaded, with peaks of up to 9 watts. So it's fairly similar to the Raspberry Pi 5, and a bit more power hungry than the Cardass Edge 2 with the same SoC. In terms of cost, only the 16 gig variant of the Pi 5 Pro is currently available at the time of making this video. It retails for $109. This is about $30 more than the best variant of the Raspberry Pi 5, the 8 gig version but you're getting double the RAM, double the CPU cores, and onboard NVMe support, so you won't need to buy an additional hat for it. So I think the price is fair in terms of value for money. 
Overall, I think the Orange Pi 5 Pro is a great alternative to the Raspberry Pi 5 if your project favors raw CPU or GPU performance, so it'll be good for computationally intensive projects and simulations. It offers much better raw performance than the Raspberry Pi 5 and is a decent set of built-in I.O. It is limited by the single PCI Express lane, so you don't get two USB 3.0 ports and the NVMe drive is only running at Gen 2 speeds, but depending on your project, this might be something you can live with. The main reason you'd want to get a Raspberry Pi 5 over the Orange Pi 5 Pro is for the software support. Orange Pi is one of the best supported alternative SBC manufacturers. But even so, their community software support is quite far behind that of Raspberry Pi. Raspberry Pi fostered a large community around their products, and this community is really good at working together to develop software and troubleshoot issues. The Orange Pi 5 Pro is a great board if there's a software package or OS image built for it, or if you've got a good understanding of software and programming. But for the average hobbyist or tinkerer, if you're trying a project that hasn't been tried before, or you're running a project that utilizes the GPO pins, then you're probably better off with the Raspberry Pi 5. Let me know what you think of the Orange Pi 5 Pro in the comments section below, and if there's anything else you'd like to see me try on it. Thanks for watching. Please remember to like this video if you enjoyed it, and subscribe for more tech and electronics, projects, tutorials, and reviews.